Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ron Ackerman, Director of Northwestern University's Institute for Public Health and Medicine. And I would like to welcome you today to our webinar series titled Explorations of Careers in Public Health, which is facilitated by Dr. Peter Orris. Dr. Orris is Chief of Occupational and Environmental Medicine at University of Illinois Health, and also as a faculty member in our Department of Preventive Medicine at Northwestern University. He has taught or co-directed several courses here at Northwestern, including a popular course that brought public health leaders to our classroom to speak about their own careers. Today, we continue that tradition with our very special guest, Dr. Maria Nayara of the World Health Organization. Dr. Nayara earned her medical degree in Spain and studied endocrinology and metabolism and also received a master's degree in public health in Paris. She joined the WHO in 1993 as the coordinator of the Global Task Force on Cholera Control. In 1999, she was the director of the Department of Control, Prevention and Eradication. And in 2005 was appointed the director of the Department of Public Health and Environment at the World Health Organization. Today, her, uh, throughout her career, she has served in many other global public health roles such as medical coordinator with Doctors Without Borders in refugee camps in Salvador and Honduras, and the Vice Minister of Health and Consumer Affairs in Spain from 2002 to 2005, as President of the Spanish Food Safety and Nutrition Agency, as the Public Health Advisor in the Ministry of Health in Maputo in Mozambique, and as UN Public Health Advisor and Physician for the United Nations Development Program in Rwanda. It's my pleasure to now turn the microphone over to Peter to lead our dialogue with Dr. Nayara. Thank you. Peter? Thank you, Ron. And uh, welcome, Maria. Uh, and you're still um, muted. There you go. Welcome. <laughs> and thank you very much for being with us. Uh, this uh, started as a rather small informal seminar for students of people in Chicago uh, doing public health. Uh, graduates, these were all graduate students in public health and talking about careers. Um, we began that way this year as well, but perforce we're using this virtual platform to have the discussion, so we lost some of the intimacy. On the other hand, it has now allowed us to reach out beyond borders and we're so happy you're with us today. Uh, and it's really an unusual opportunity for all of us to, and for me especially because this is the course I wanted to have in public health school some years ago. And uh, over a period of years, these are all the questions I wanted to ask you that I never got a chance to ask. <laughs> I'm concerned now, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll take it as far until we start getting questions from the um, uh, people who are attending. Um, and again, you need to put them in the QA, not the chat section. And uh, then, then I will start just feeding them to you and we'll let this go where it wants to. And as I told you privately and repeat for the group, if there are things that you think you really want to tell us here, current uh, uh, demands and or not demands, but rather current challenges and where you think the, the situation globally is going, please <laughs> feel free. But let me begin back in medical school. Why, why did you decide to go to medical school? And um, uh, this schooling was in Spain and you grew up in Spain in the early 60s. Why, uh, why in the 70s were you deciding to go to medical school? What did you want to do with that? Thank you, Peter, and thank you for disclosing uh, an important information related to the time when I went to university. You are going to pay for this one. Anyway, I suppose that we couldn't keep that secret for a long time when uh, describing the career. I have no idea. Uh, I don't have anyone in my family who was a medical doctor. They were all coming from completely different backgrounds. But what I can tell you is that since I was a little child, I say, I want to be a doctor. Don't ask me why. And I have uh, no idea, but I never ever contemplate 
any other career than uh, being a, a, a physician. Obviously, um, my initial vocation was uh, I wanted to be a surgeon. Thanks God I didn't because I have no capacity at all. I mean, my, my, my <laughs> manual capacity is quite limited. So very, very soon I discovered that no that and I oriented my career somewhere else. But uh, I remember reading a book about the first uh, surgeons and the, the discovery of the anesthesia. And I was so fascinated by, by that, that uh, I don't know, has always been in me that I wanted to be a doctor and a doctor that will be traveling. Somehow I managed, I still don't know how, but I think I managed to do the two things and I never ever regretted that decision. I, I'm, I'm one of those privileged ones of um, being very happy with uh, what I choose as a professional in private life. And it's, I'm really, again, very privileged to, to, to be able to do what I wanted to do at that time. And, and you began in endocrinology uh, and metabolic diseases, which I, I was unaware of. Um, that sounds more laboratory. It sounds more um, restricted individually. Uh, from there, you went to public health, but, just, but in Paris, how, how did this occur? Why? Okay, my, my, uh, after finishing uh, medicine, I wanted to specialize. And uh, for me, yes, I wanted to be an endocrinologist. Why endocrinologist? Because it was so, so logic. I mean, the day I discovered the famous feedback, you know, when you don't have enough, you, you go for more and you have this feedback. So endocrinology is such a fantastic, and then having the, the hormones controlling everything, I thought it was fascinating. I didn't want to be a gynecologist for sure. I didn't want to be a pediatrician because, not because I don't admire them, but uh, I thought endocrinology was fantastic. And this was one of the reasons I decided to specialize in Paris because it was a very good school there that I wanted to go. And I really enjoy it. I, I, I was prepared to be a, a diabetologist. I was very much on the, my thesis was on, uh, on the thyroid problems. And I was very satisfied for that. I thought I would be a, 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 an endocrinologist for the rest of my life. But then one night in Paris, a friend of us invited us for a session with uh, Doctors Without Borders, you know, Médecins Sans Frontières. And uh, it was fascinating for me. So I say, okay, I will be an endocrinologist once I finish my, my specialization. But before that, I want to spend six months with Medicine Sans Frontier. Of course, those six months have changed my life and uh, I discovered the, the, the public health because uh, in reality, I have a master in public health in Paris, but uh, the place where I learned it, Public health was on a refugee camp in Central America at the border between Honduras and El Salvador. When you go there as a, as a young doctor and you think that you have to treat patients and it's your passion and it's your vocation and you feel very committed and convinced about that. But then you treat the same asthma case to a little child. You treat uh, uh, diarrhea uh, to the same child three times the same week. Then you start to say, what is going on? I mean, what are, is the cause of all of that? I need to understand the, the, the reasons for, for having all of these diseases. And then, wow, the public health came to me and that was really a, a fantastic. Uh, I, I still feel a, a clinician somehow. I, I still feel like a, if in a plane they say, is there a doctor? I, I'm still run. And then while I'm running, I say, where are you going? But I still feel like a clinician and a medical doctor, but uh, public health for me has been an incredible discovery and I never abandoned it since then. Uh, on a way or another, I think it's my, my real vocation, yeah. There's a piece left out of that. Uh, <laughs> many people do some public health, uh, are in uh, areas such as uh, working at, uh, in our country, in uh, federally qualified health centers, poor communities, racially uh, uh, disparate communities, etc. Not everybody goes to join a group where they're in fact shooting around you and shooting and, and placing yourself in a considerable amount of risk in these camps and later, I think, in Mozambique, etc. Why? 
what what were there about that? Why was that commitment important? You know, uh, this is a question that uh, you don't do things always for a logic or a rational thing. I was a very young doctor, specialized on endocrinology, living in Paris, and then deciding that Paris was fantastic, but that the wall was really big, you know? So even if you, you in Paris, you feel that you are in the center of the wall, or at least the French, they think they are the center of the wall. I hope there are not French among the audience, but probably they will not feel offended. They, they are very much convinced that this is the case. But still, uh, as I say, uh, I wanted to discover more and to see more. And then obviously it was very risky, um, but I was so unconscious at that time. I mean, when I, when I tell people anecdotes about what we, we, we saw at the refugee camp and how the political situation was and how naive politically we were, because we were a bunch of uh, very committed and engaged uh, doctors, certainly more or less well-trained. But in terms of the political situation where we were getting in, in the middle of the guerrilla and the, you know, all the movement in Central America with the freedom fighters and the Americans very much infiltrated as well there. So we were not really, at one point they were the, the Hondurians were accusing me, oh, you are a Cuban infiltrate communist. And I said, come on, I'm the same one that yesterday, few kilometers away, you were accusing me of being a colonialist American uh, the, uh, CIA. So I'm the same person, hello. So it, it, you don't realize where you are. And certainly we were in the middle of very, very dangerous situation without being conscious. But this changed your life as well. Uh, you start to see things differently and... Uh, and you want to do more. I mean, you, you realize that you, you, your ambition on, in terms of public health grows so much that you just say, no, no, no. I mean, treating patients is very, very rewarding, but now I need to see how can I improve the way these people cook. And instead of cooking on an open fire inside a little uh, refugee where they were without ventilation and then inhaling all of this uh, toxic air, you, you want to have something better. You, have a, you want to, to have a good vaccination campaign. You want to have a good training course for, for the, the women and, and, and preparing for, for, for the delivery. And you start to see more and more you want to impact rather than one-to-one -one patient. So once you discover that, it's, it's very rewarding and you want to go for more. So for me, reaching WHO was kind of the maximum because here is where if you use properly the tool, I mean, the, the, the institution, you can have an incredible impact in, in, in public health. And as I discovered some time ago, you spent time in Brazil as well. Was that with Pajo or was that later? I, I, I've been searching for that in your official biographies and I can't find it. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I, I uh, yes, I, I've been in Brazil as well. I spent five years in Africa, two years in, in refugee camps in Central America. And then, you know, we, I travel a lot uh, with WHO. At the beginning of my career in WHO, I was the responsible for uh, the cholera task force and other the epidemic diarrheal diseases. I used to call myself at that time the fecal point of WHO. And uh, yes, I remember on a meeting, people were introducing themselves and say, I'm professor such and such. And then when it was my turn, I said, well, I'm the cholera coordinator, the fecal point of WHO. And then an Anglo-Saxon person next to me says, no, my dear, I suppose you want to say the focal point. I say, no, no, the fecal, the fecal point, because I was in charge of all the epidemic diarrheal diseases. So somebody has to do it. So. It was very good. So in that uh, responsibility, of course, uh, I was traveling to all the, the horrible um, cholera epidemics around the world and, and, and among them, yes, in, in everywhere. Brazil is because the program of um, leprosy, you know, that uh, India and Brazil were at that time uh, places where still have leprosy cases and we wanted to eliminate leprosy. Uh, and we put it in place a, a very, very interesting program to, to, to distribute for free the treatment and making sure that people will have access to early diagnosis. So fascinating as well, yeah. And then back to Spain for government service. 
Yeah, that was very interesting. Once I was in Doble Cho, at one point, uh, somebody called and say, uh, just one second, I will pass you the minister. So which minister? I mean, the person thought that being a minister is, is the only one in the world. And then somebody told me, say, well, I need you at the government in Spain. You have to be vice minister of health for the food safety agency. And I said, ah, oh, no, thank you. I'm not interested. But then I told to Brundtland, who was at that time our director general, Jo Harlan Brundtland, you know, she was amazing, this woman. And uh, she told me, she says, no, don't do that. Uh, you will regret it. You always regret uh, things that you didn't do. And this is good for the organization. If you go, you get an experience at the government, you come back. So I will give you an special leave without pay. So I went there for three years to put in place the, the, the food safety agency in Spain and nutrition. We transformed it in nutrition as well. And one of the most interesting programs apart from the food safety was on the prevention of obesity program that I really enjoy it, you know, in a country like Spain where obesity is, is growing and, and the people enjoy a lot of the social activities around food, like we all do, it was really very, very interesting to put in place this program, yes, a, a rewarding experience to be at the government and it has been really very useful for, for when I came back to WHO, the fact that I've been at the government myself, understanding a little bit more the mechanism and how to use that uh, machinery, uh, I think it was extremely useful for me. And was it then that you made the jump over the broad chasm from infectious disease, public health to uh, environmental or chronic disease, uh, the second uh, epidemiologic revolution, if you will? Yeah, I think I think it, somehow there is a is a is a logic sequence, even if it doesn't look like. But you start with outbreaks of infectious diseases, which tells you somehow those outbreaks are telling you that there are some system, systemic failures in the system, you know, and then you need to address it. And then, as I say, you want to do more on public health. So I I, I started to look at all the issues that will define and determine how we will be more, more healthy or less healthy. And uh, this is why when, when they, they, in WHO they proposed me, when I came back from Spain, they say, now there is something very interesting that is taking a lot of attention is uh, the protection of the human environment was called at that time. And I say, what? No, thank you. But then I transformed it on public health and environment. So we were looking at how the environment will determine our health. We started to talk about the environmental determinants of health. We started to talk about the primary prevention, how we could touch it, or the way we were using chemicals. And Peter, you and I, we have met in many meetings around the world on, on, on the use, the wise use of, of chemicals. And uh, all the, the, the environmental issues like air pollution that, uh, as you know, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest public health issues now, uh, 7 million premature deaths every year caused by air pollution. Climate change was starting to, to become not only an environmental issue, but a public health, and is now more than ever a public health issue more than an environmental one. And therefore, of course, that was, again, fascinating, and, and I'm very much in love with that. I think that will be my my kind of last uh, movement because this is so big, so so wow, so broad. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I have a number of questions. Let me. Uh, uh, there's a question about resources, but I will take that up uh, within the context of your last several difficult years at WHO. So we'll put that aside for a moment. Uh, and uh, uh, let me uh, read this one. Um, Hello, Maria. Thank you for taking uh, talking about your experience. I'm a senior undergraduate student graduating with a BA in public health this semester. What professional opportunities do you think are already available for those with a bachelor's degree in public health who are looking to be involved in the workforce immediately after graduation? Yeah. Uh, of course, the, the, the public health is a, is a branch now that is very, very important. I would recommend that maybe you need to 
between public health, you need to look at a little bit more, focusing a little bit more. Uh, there is a, a big movement now around the, the, the climate change, for instance, and the linkages between climate change and health. You will have probably a lot of opportunities on that related to from the advocacy to the, the, the scientific evidence and then transforming that into policies. I think more and more uh, public health will have a role on, on influencing the, 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 the way we will be living influencing political decisions. I think we need to stop to be shy, you know, as, as public health officers and just to go in with uh, the standardized recommendations. This is the moment now to, to recover from the COVID-19 and uh, this recovery, this healthy and green recovery has to be green or it will not be. So how we propose this green recovery, it will be by asking governments to stop paying subsidies to fossil fuels. Is this something that a public health officer is prepared to do? Are we ready to, to go as far as uh, helping countries to decide on their en energy transition, energy policy? And I think we do. So there will be plenty of connection with the energy sector, with the transport sector. We need to look for what is the, the next mobility, how people will be commuting uh, the next urban transition. There will be a fascinating uh, uh, urban development design, how the cities of the, not of the future, the, fu the cities of tomorrow there will be. And I see again, an opportunity for the public health officers, but the real public health officers means not the old fashioned, with all due respect, I'm probably one of the old fashioned public health officers, but don't put barriers to you. Don't put yourself limits on public health. If you are a good public health officer, you need to be able to influence energy, transport, any type of mobility, how our buildings will be uh, designed and then how will be the energy, the efficiency, how we will be our cities plan and how the cities should consume, how our food system, systems will be. So keep a very open mind on, on, on the public health. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of needs on that, in that sense. And then we have some questions coming in uh, more practical about working in WHO, et cetera. But let me start with the more general one. Hello, Maria, thank you for speaking with us. I will be graduating with a master's degree in May. What professional experiences do you feel are the most important to seek out as someone who would like someday to work internationally with WHO? And does that include advanced degrees or, or how do people operate uh, internationally? I, I will recommend you to have some field experience before maybe reaching to WHO, uh, maybe working with an NGO or working on a country project or even on your own country, but looking for certain communities where public health needs to be a little bit stressed. Look for big campaigns like uh, tobacco. How do we did on the tobacco? How we did, uh, how we are doing now on, 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 on air pollution? Look at the, the, the issues at the European Commission. They are, they are looking for, for interns, for, for volunteers. In WHO, we have a very nice program of volunteers, but unfortunately now with the, the COVID is, um, for the time being, is, is, is frozen, but I hope we will reopen it again. But again, make sure that you, you, you learn a little bit about how an international organization operates and um, understand as well that the network of, of, of groups that are operating, there are plenty of conventions, chemical conventions, environmental conventions, legal conventions related to public health. They, they, even the climate change negotiations are such a heavy thing. So you need to, to, to look at which type of public health will you like to, or if you want to go on the more classical public health approach in terms of uh, being an epidemiologist or, 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 or supporting on emerging infectious diseases, uh, detection and control, it depends. But there are, there are different groups uh, uh, working on different areas. The opportunities on international organization is little by little infiltrating yourself by being an intern maybe, by having some field experience with an NGO that collaborates, 
keep in touch with uh, the, the, the work the organization is doing, read as much as you can, and write to the people working in WHO. And then if there are positions, of course, you, you have to apply. But that will be probably, the way to start will be probably first as with some field experience. So, oh, I was going to add only uh, within the U.S., uh, the question of uh, becoming a researcher for CDC over a period of time and then being seconded to WHO or other international agencies is also uh, another route. Uh, but clearly, the kind of uh, base uh, community activity that you were involved in, and, and you were a clinician, a physician doing that, but um, there were many other skills within Doctors Without Borders, I am sure, to support those activities in those communities. Yeah, in those days, it's not just the Doctors Without Borders. You have pharmacians without, pharmacians without borders. You have uh, plenty of NGOs that are working on, on many uh, different projects and uh, from uh, nutritional projects for vaccination, community engagement, uh, training on, 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 public, on uh, health promotion, uh, training for, for uh, health workers on, 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 on many aspects. So you have a lot of, maybe if you work on an on a, on a institution in your own country, and then you get in touch and you, you make sure that you participate to some meetings that you get uh, familiarized with the work, then you can request maybe your professor to, to get in touch with the department and offer an exchange for, or, or you contribute with a work, you request to be part of one of the working groups, expert working groups that we have in WHO. Keep an eye always on, and there is WHO, but there are many other institutions as well uh, that uh, are of international. I was mentioning the European Commission, maybe for, for Americans might not be the most uh, easy one to get, but there are plenty of institutions now that might need. And after the pandemic, I think uh, many of non-traditional institutions will be happy to have an advisor on, on public health from the global perspective. Hmm. So while you're catching your breath, um, let me, uh, the, the other question uh, also relates to future employment and careers with WHO, but uh, takes us back more specifically to what appears to be a bit of a confusion as to what WHO does. Uh, and what do working groups do? Uh, because it asks a question about somebody who's a researcher who's interested in a number of public health topics as a researcher. Uh, and the question then is, uh, does that WHO do research? So let me let you do ABCs of WHO's responsibilities. Okay, uh, that's, that's very interesting because I, I don't know how people imagine WHO. Um, we have six fundamental functions, the f but probably the most um, interesting and powerful one, if you use it properly, is the convening power. So obviously we don't have the best experts on the world working with us in WHO. Fortunately, I mean, I'm the proof that I'm not the best expert, but the, the, the beauty of working in WHO is that you can convene the best experts. So we say, okay, now during the COVID, we needed an example. Um, we need to do uh, um, guidelines on ventilation, you know, because of the, the for, for public buildings, for, for, for even home. Uh, so we need to do a roadmap on ventilation. Of course, we don't have the best and the top of the experts on ventilation or the engineers and the, the, the environmentalists that they know about all of this. The physicists are working now very much in a specialty that is called aerobiologist. That's fascinating. Well, I was in charge of that. So I created a group uh, which is called ECAP, Engineers and Environmental Expert Group. I reach out to, 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 to a group uh, who were very uh, knowledgeable. They provide me other names that we did a systematic review. We, we did the conflict of interest and all of that. And we put it in place, that group. And through that group, the interesting thing is that um, 
you know, you have a huge professor, a big professor who is very, very well known, but that professor always involves his team. So maybe uh, researchers, uh, more junior researchers working with them, and through that you get familiar. So this is just an example of a working group. And uh, so in a few months, three months, I think we have these guidelines with all the, 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 the steps, obviously because it was very urgent, so somehow the steps were respected, but uh, the speed was a little bit accelerated. And uh, I can tell you that they are the best of the best. So certainly I'm not an expert on, on, on ventilation. I know how to use and what are the questions that I need answer from those experts and how to finalize this road, roadmap in response to uh, the, the, the pandemic and what are the questions that we need and how we need to communicate that. So we have that now, we, we establish the roadmap on how to communicate about who will communicate, and but we can be sure that science was based on that. So this is the beautiful question, the uh, uh, function of WHO, the convening one. Then we set up the, the agenda for research. So we, we, we look at what are the priorities on research. And again, we do the research through the different working groups and the, 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 the best experts around the world. We, we provide a technical assistance to countries. So uh, if uh, Burkina Faso says, uh, yeah, we, we need to organize uh, now, for instance, on chemicals that Peter has been working on that very much, we need to involve uh, health authorities into into uh, uh, how to to which chemicals and should be banned or how to put in place a legislation or how to put in place a system for food uh, to have a national food system or or advice on the, the universal health coverage so all of that is one of the functions as well providing this technical support and then we respond to, to emergencies and we keep this, I would say, global surveillance and uh, detection and then a response to that. And uh, of course, we, 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 we have as well the, the, the capacity to, I hope, anticipate trends. So what will be the next problem, not only in terms of infectious diseases, but uh, Okay, now it will be violence against women, it will be cervical cancer, it will be, uh, and then we pre-qualify drugs and, and, and treatments and vaccines. So it's very large spectrum, but uh, there are six fundamental functions that are the ones that will allow us uh, to, to, to move in that direction. At the end of the day, what we want is to, to elaborate policy recommendations useful for, for governments or member states in different aspects of, uh, of public health. I hope this has contributed. So the, the possibilities of working with WHO are huge. It can be from, uh, we have legal people working with us, lawyers, obviously they need to look at many treaties and the, the health implications. We have a specialist on social scientists. They look at uh, social determinants of health, equity, gender, um, all the, the issues related to Com how to communicate. We have a specialist on communication. Uh, we have uh, uh, clinicians, uh, but not so many. I mean, medical doctors by training. We have uh, uh, veterinarian, public health officers. We have uh, economists, health economists. We have epidemiologists. We have uh, toxicologists. We have uh, environmentalists, specialists on water and sanitation. So there are a uh, broad spectrum and, 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 and very good people working with WHO. The ways to get in, there are advertised positions, but as I say, first get familiar, be part of a working group and try to have a very solid uh, CV, of course. Yes. So <laughs> that's exactly what we needed. Now, it, 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 let me ask you a little broader than that about um, uh, perhaps uh, the uh, frustrations or the uh, advantages. Uh, and I would compare them to your earlier service with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, working with NGOs uh, on a global level uh, would seem to have some benefits and some 
uh, decrements in their, in their abilities to reach people. Uh, with WHO, the primary uh, uh, priority setting is coming from the ministries of health, as I recall, of the different countries. Would you want to contrast those two settings for people interested in moving in that area? Yes, uh, WHO, our main uh, constituency is coming from the ministries of health. So every year in May, we have the World Health Assembly where 194 ministers of health around the world, they come to Geneva or they used to come. Now we will have a virtual meeting and it will be the second one virtual World Health Assembly is very, I mean, very different from what we have before because when you have the ministers and all the delegations, it's a very rich moment where you change. And in that meeting that the World Health Assembly is the moment where you discuss resolutions on what are the, the, the big uh, health topics uh, uh, and uh, how the countries will align to, to, to tackle that problem. The, 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 the request from them sometimes to introduce some, some critical health issues that were not considered until then. Uh, I don't know how we will be eradicating polio, what are the next steps. On air pollution, we have a very strategic uh, global strategy and that we need to implement. It was a very difficult negotiation, but the countries committed to certain things. And there are certain roles for the ministers of health. Obviously, uh, the ministers of health sometimes are the ones then uh, at the country level, they don't have all of those capacities to influence the way we, we put in place a norm. Uh, legislation around chemicals or or how we influence the, the tobacco companies or the the alcohol or or how do you uh, influence a, a transition to to a renewable source of energy this type of things but is 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 a very important moment where you set up the agenda of global public health and what are the big issues that you need to uh, discuss this last year of course most of the World Health Assembly was dedicated to the COVID, but through COVID, you touch a lot of issues. We touch it on inequities. We touch it on the importance of having universal health coverage and the fact that some countries around the world, they still don't have a universal health coverage. You touch issues about uh, research, the, the, the fact that you need to develop a vaccine how much we are spending in research, how much we are investing, not spending, but investing on research, uh, what's happened with the health professionals, how are we using the, 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 the health professionals, do we have enough capacity, do we have enough uh, professionals around the world, uh, how those professionals are moving from a country to another. In, in Africa, we are losing a lot, a lot of, of, of uh, health professionals. They move to other countries and therefore they have promised how to... So through COVID, we, we can touch on many things on the epidemiological systems, on the collaboration between countries, on the exchange of information, on the, how to mobilize uh, the, 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 the scientific community to become, uh, I mean, to provide the new treatments, new diagnostics and uh, new vaccines. So it has been really an example, the COVID-19, but in fact, you touch all the aspects of, uh, of global health just to address this one. And uh, around that, you have uh, now the issue of uh, poverty, of uh, violence, or, and then losing the, 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 the fantastic capacity we, we had on, on, on certain health systems in certain countries that now is going back. So that would be quite uh, tough after the, the COVID-19. That's why I asked the, the organizers to share this uh, WHO manifesto for a healthy and green recovery. There are just uh, six prescriptions that if you read it, they are common sense, but the strategic one, now that the countries are dedicating a big amount of financial resources to the so-called recovery, we need to make sure as the health, public health community that this, those investments are going into the right direction. We cannot keep destroying nature or ecosystems as we have been doing now. This is quite stupid in our side. And it's not just a question of environmentalism and, and Greenpeace movement. I think it's a question of public health. If we pollute the water we drink, if we pollute the oceans, or oh, you know, you were asking me for opportunities for work. 
plastics in the ocean. You have an idea and, and, and ideas for research. I mean, all of those plastics, uh, tons, millions of tons of plastic in the, in the, in the oceans, how this will change our food chain, our, how this will be affecting our health. All of those rivers totally polluted as well. Where are these masks going to end? That will be an environmental issue as well. And uh, thanks God people is not anymore using those gloves that they were using at the beginning. Uh, so there are so many interesting questions that now we need to provide advice and be there to respond to all of those questions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, an undergraduate and, uh, and myself, we're just starting to look at the question of masks and other PPE and, uh, and the uh, lifestyle, uh, et cetera. So interesting, just here. Uh, I have some practical questions on the QAs, and that is uh, they want to know which degree uh, these are uh, our students here are, you know, either have an MPH, maybe getting an MD, have an MD, uh, getting an MPH, uh, and, uh, may, or maybe straight PhD, RN, PhD, etc. How does, is one of these degrees better than another internationally uh, to move ahead and open doors and let's say follow a career such as yours? You know, you, you can have, a, I mean, PhDs are always very much welcome, no doubt, but it depends at which level of your career. As I said, we have, uh, if, you, if I look at the team working with me, uh, we have uh, several people with PhDs, but we have several people with uh, a, a MPH. We have uh, several people with uh, a degree on toxicology and a degree on, on, on biology. Uh, the, we have uh, people who are experts on communication, for instance, that are not, uh, uh, they don't have a master or, or we have people on resource mobilization, for instance, that's, that's another, or, or um, but uh, normally it's people with um, uh, a master degree, at least, if you don't have a master degree, it will be difficult. It depends for which specialty, but don't be, my recommendation will be to, don't be too generalist. That's the thing, because you can be very specialized on uh, saying, okay, uh, uh, on what we were saying on plastics, uh, pollution, and uh, I've been working on that. I know all the, the, the networks and, uh, and therefore uh, I can contribute to that. Or we have people hyper specialized on, on climate change and vector borne diseases. Or, uh, but you, you need to have an open mind, but uh, don't be um, too superficial. I mean, you need to, to have an added value for, for the department that will engage you. Unless you start very, very junior, but because by chance you started on a, on a little thing and then you grow up and then by doing so, you develop your career. But in WHO normally we don't have this type of career, starting very junior and then doing your career at, at, until the end. Some people is recruited because you need that type of specialist. So you have a malariologist coming maybe in the middle of his uh, professional career, his or her professional career or you have some junior people who are doing a thesis or, or, or a PhD and then they, by chance they got in touch and then they started to collaborate with that program on mental health or, or drugs abuse, and then you, you develop. So as you can see, there are so, it's so broad that I will not give you a, an answer. We have all types of diplomas, the better trained you are, I mean, the more trained you are, the, the better, for sure. But as I say, not to generalist, try to know and bring some specific knowledge with you. And there's a real practical question from a social scientist. Uh, do I go to the WHO web pages to look for the jobs that may be available in my area? Is that uh, an, an effective methodology or first should I look to become involved in a working group or have some interaction with the agency? Do the two things at the same time. I mean, I, I tried uh, to, to get in contact with the groups, familiarize with yourself on, on the social sciences that WHO is doing. And if you are a social scientist, 
you need to look at other organizations. You need to look at uh, as well, and not only WHO, you need to look at uh, UNICEF. You need to look at uh, UNESCO. You can look at uh, WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. They are they have very interesting jobs as well on, on, on uh, you need to look at uh, the International Agency on Energy or IRENA, the International Agency for Renewable Energy. Uh, you will discover the family of, of uh, UN, which is huge, FAO. FAO is now looking very much at this one health approach, animal health uh, interaction with the uh, human health. And the uh, FAO is, is uh, they, they, they they, I think a public health will be uh, an interesting, and sociologists definitely will be an interesting uh, approach for them as well. So look at the, 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 the huge uh, UN family, you will be surprised about the many, many, and maybe look even at the, the, the UN family, not only on their headquarters, but at the country level. Sometimes it's easier to get uh, an enter to the, the UN um, organizations through the country offices. Uh, WHO has offices in more than 140 countries. And some of those offices are in countries that are not too far away from you. It's true that now is not a moment for traveling, but uh, you know, and sometimes it's easier to, to, to get through a country office because the, the, you have more opportunities and then from there try to reach the regional or global level. We have six regional offices as well. We have one in Manila, one in Delhi, we have one in, in, in Africa, in Brazzaville, we have one in Copenhagen, uh, we have one in, in Cairo, and uh, I mentioned- Oh no, Washington. Oh, Pajo, Washington, of course, Pajo. So you have one in Washington as well, a regional office, and plenty of country offices of Pajo, in Latin American countries. So let me give you a uh, final time to uh, talk about uh, uh, priorities, et cetera. With the US no longer rattling its saber and uh, cutting budgets and uh, cutting off WHO and returning to the fray, if you will, uh, but a setting in which we know that WHO has had many uh, budgetary cutbacks or challenges, not just in the last administration here, but prior to that, merely walking through the office and, and seeing how many offices are empty, etc., reveals that. Where do you see <coughs> that moving ahead in terms of uh, resources from governments? How uh, is WHO able to leverage private resources? Uh, how do they keep uh, for-profit entities at arm's length, yet still leverage some of those resources? And what do you see as the most important ones to move ahead on at this period, maybe giving programmatic areas for people to think about careers? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question. WHO is very um, careful with uh, the, the, the sources of funds we are accepting. In principle, our funds are coming from governments. And then we have uh, extra budgetary contributions from big foundations, but they need to go through a very uh, <laughs> intense uh, selection process and criteria for making sure that they are not influencing. I'm sure that you all know the Gates Foundation. Uh, this is a, a, as well an opportunity for, for, for people like you to, to, to search for, for job opportunities. The, the Gates Foundation, Bloomberg has a big foundation as well. Uh, there are, as well in, in Europe, that they welcome us. Uh, you have uh, many big foundations with a good name, with a good reputation. And now WHO is, is just to put in place a new idea of um, a WHO Foundation. So this WHO Foundation will help us to, to look for private sector contribution, of course, going to, we will never accept funds from a tobacco related company or weapons, obviously, but um, there, there, there will be uh, uh, private funds that might come to this foundation and then uh, put it on a, on a clean way that then we can use those funds without any type of influence from, from those uh, private sector. Obviously, we will never receive money from Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola or any of those, uh, I would say, more difficult to, 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 to handle 
uh, and that might have an impact on public health. So, but there are plenty of big foundations that uh, work on public health and they um, cleaner fund now. They now there are plenty of groups, NGOs, uh, associations, groups, and uh, and foundations around the issue of clean air. As you know, air pollution is one of the huge things. So I will see a lot on 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 this one. Have a look at that clean air or air pollution. There is a, a plethora of, of organizations that are created around that. And it's a way as well to, to start. I will strongly recommend you to have a look at the air pollution issue because it's not just the air pollution and how it's affect our health, it's how we will tackle the causes of air pollution. And again, this will request us to look at the energy transition, energy efficiency, how we build our houses, our buildings, how we uh, organize our cities, how we plan and, and design our cities. So, and then the commuting and, uh, you know, there are plenty of, even for sociologists, this is a very interesting area, how people can um, be aware of, 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 of uh, the exposure to air pollution. Things are changing now uh, uh, in UK, you probably heard about the case of Ella uh, Casey, uh, this little girl who passed away with uh, horrible attacks of asthma and for the first time in a court, uh, the coroner recognized uh, air pollution on her death certificate. Mm -hmm. So the, the death uh, cause was not just uh, asthma, it was uh, air pollution. So there will be legal issues around that and may, very sociological ones because as you know, it, depending on where you live on a city, even if the air we breathe is this, the same to all of us, but if you live on a very poor uh, environment, you will be more exposed to that pollution. So there are plenty of equity issues and, and, and sociological issues around the, 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 the quality of the air we breathe. In India, they are starting to, the rich people are, are starting to create what they call oxygen bars. You know, you go to a bar and you have your, you can <laughs> have your oxygen, that, that's ridiculous. But anyway, there are plenty of issues related to the socioeconomic status and the sociological uh, community studies around that are very, very interesting. So, um, yeah. I think I will, yeah. Do you, let me ask this in a political way, do you see some of the governments uh, responding in this broad, uh, clearly public health way, or is there a strength, or is there a um, initiative in some governments to merely concentrate on the infectious disease, better computers, better laboratories, better communication that can respond in a more rapid manner, in a more narrow, if you will, approach, equally needed for a more narrow approach. Yeah, I'm afraid, yeah, most of the response will be about better epidemiological surveillance systems, early detection, uh, quick collaboration on laboratories, quick collaboration on, on response, certain uh, public health measures like uh, travel restrictions or trade restrictions in place is, is very much firefighters, which is extremely important, no doubt. But that's why um, we need to make sure that it's not just that, because if, if we think that public health is just a, the response to a, 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 an infectious and an emerging infectious agent, we are totally wrong because the next crisis is already here and it's called climate change and this will be affecting our health dramatically. And uh, so it's not just, a, it's, it's the way we are engaging with the environment, the ecosystems, the way that we need to probably change uh, how we prevent the diseases and how, more important than preventing diseases, how we reduce our vulnerability to the next crisis. And the next crisis might be a new virus, but it might be as well, or is already there, the, the, the climate change or a crisis created by ourselves, like a lack of biodiversity or what we are doing now in terms of the toxic air we breathe or the, the tons of plastic that we are eating every, every, every day now. So, uh... 
we're right in the middle of giving somebody one last question. Perhaps Ron, uh, did you want to say something in closing? And uh, I would just say thank you so much, Maria. Really appreciate it. I owe you. Uh, and hopefully when we can all get back together, uh, we're looking forward to those meetings as well. So thank you. Thank you so please. Thank you. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. I hope it was a little bit useful. So useful. Thank you so much, Maria. We really appreciate your time. Ron, you pronounced my family name so good. <laughs> It was almost a like. I thought I did terribly. Yeah. 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 No, no, it was. Uh, wow. <laughs> I was really impressed. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It was really a pleasure. And uh, keep safe and healthy. Okay. And happy. You, you as well. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.